Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by Western Stuff. Well, that might be a bit extreme, but we are heading out west. That's a bit more like it. I'll tell you more after this incredible five-minute mystery. Our story takes place in Green's Gap, a small town in the southern cavern district. Green's Gap Hospital, Dr. Melville speaking. Doctor, doctor, there's been an accident out in Echo Cavern. Accident? What kind of accident? But two men was exploring, and they got lost last night. One's unconscious. You better come quick before he's dead. I hope you know how to get out to Echo Cavern, Lem. Well, Doc, being town constable and ambulance driver, I reckon I know about all there is to know about this country. Ever been in the cavern, Lem? Once, Doc Melville, when I was a boy. <laughs> Nearly got my heart hand off of my paw. Echo Cavern's a mighty treacherous place. You mean it's uh, easy to get lost in? Yeah, not only that, Doc. It's had cavern gas, carbon uh, something. Carbon dioxide? Yes, that's it. All of a sudden, you run into some of that stuff, and before you know it, bing, you're out. Still, people seem to go exploring there. More fools you be. I wouldn't go into them caverns. Least twice not without a dog. A dog? What for? Well, if a dog keels over, then you know the gas is collecting. I'm afraid, Mr. Gatter, your friend is dead. Yeah, poor Patsy. It was from the gas, wasn't it, Doc? That's what it looks like to me. And why did you go in that cavern anyway? Well, Patsy asked me to. He never seen a cave before. How far did you go in? Well, it didn't seem very far, but all of a sudden we lost our way. Well, where was that? Well, how do I know whereabouts it was if we was lost? We, we tried to trace our way back, but it wasn't no use. And Patsy started to get scared. It's kind of funny to see a big guy like that get scared. Yeah, see? He's rather big, isn't he? Yeah, six foot four. The mob used to call us Mutton Jeff. And then what happened? Well, I was a little scared myself. But we stuck together, you know, walking in the dark with only my flash in the car. And all of a sudden, Patsy keeled over. From the gas? Yeah, that's what I figured. His head hit on a rock, and I guess that just about finished him off. Yeah. I suppose you reckon yourself pretty lucky, mister. Yeah, sure. I, I figure it was only because I'm five foot three that I got out of there alive. And the gas must have been just about a foot over my head. Yeah. And what do you think of that, Jock Melville? I think you'd better arrest Mr. Getty for the murder of his friend, Patsy. What was the flaw in Getty's story? Do you know it? In a moment, we'll hear from Lamb and Dr. Melville. But first... You know... What I feel bad is about the dogs. See, old Shep agrees with me. Well, in 1911, they still used small animals, including dogs, to detect carbon monoxide poisoning. However, the practice ended with the advent of the canary. That can't be right. Check it out. I will. But first, here is the rest of the story. Now, let's see whether you're as observant as Lem and the doctor. Hey, copper, let me put my hands down. They're tired. When well, you're in Green Gap Jail, not before. I don't get it. It was a good story. I still can't figure how you found out. 
Lem tells me they used to take dogs in the cavern because the gas is heavier than air. It collects on the floor. If you really met gas, you would have keeled over first before your pal Patsy. Well, what do you know? I tell you, nowadays in this murder racket, you need a college education. Hmm. I think common sense would have been more than enough. Agreed. Mr. Getty does seem to lack the brain power of a rock, not unlike yourself. Oh. That's a good one. Did you come up with that all by yourself? Of course. You make it so easy to insult you. And you make it so easy to punch your face. Is that you said? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Do you like stories about the Old West? Why, yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> then you're in for a treat. On These Are Your Stories, we have two campfire-style ghost tales that are right out of the Old West. Then we debut a new OTR classic series called Frontier Town. This series had a short run in 1949, but the adventures are oh so amazing. Why is that? Well... Because they are? Even our Audible review this time takes us into the world of Louis L'Amour. So, are you ready for the Western stuff? Yeah! Well, alrighty then. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? Sackett's Land by Louis L'Amour, narrated by John Curlis. You've probably heard of the Sacketts. They are the unforgettable pioneer family created by master storyteller Louis L'Amour. You no doubt have seen the movies. But did you know that there is a series of 17 books? Each Sackett novel is a complete, exciting historical adventure, and as a group, they form an epic story of the building of a mighty nation. They are the men and women who challenged the untamed wilderness with their dreams and their courage. From generation to generation, they pushed ever westward with a restless wandering urge and a fierce independence. The Sacketts always stood tall and they would unite to take on any and all challenges, no matter how overwhelming the odds. Here is a brief introduction to these books by Louis Lamar himself. History is not made only by kings and parliaments, presidents, wars and generals. It is a story of people, of their love, honor, faith, hope and suffering, of birth and death, of hunger, thirst and cold, of loneliness and sorrow. In writing my stories, I have found myself looking back again and again to origins, to find and clearly see the ancestors of the pioneers. Some time ago, I decided to tell the story of the American frontier through the eyes of three families, fictional families, but with true and factual experiences. The names I chose were Sackett, Chantry, and Talon. There is a real Sackett family, my research revealed, 
which derives from the Isle of Ely in Cambridgeshire, England. For historical accuracy, I decided to bring my fictional sackets from the same area. Cambridgeshire is fen country, low, boggy land partially covered with water, and the fen men were men of independent mind, as are my fictional sackets. They were also hunters and fishermen, which was important, though few of those who first landed in America had any idea of how to survive. In a land teeming with game, with edible wild plants, many were starving in the midst of plenty, and had to learn hunting and fishing from the Indians. Story by story, generation by generation, these families are moving westward. When the journeys are ended, and the forty-odd books are completed, the reader should have a fairly true sense of what happened on the American frontier. The story that follows is of the first Sackett to come to America. So what is this book about? Well, it is titled Sackett's Land, and it was first published in 1974. After discovering six golden coins buried in the mud of Devil's Dyke, Barnabas Sackett enthusiastically invests in goods that he will offer for trade in America. But Sackett has a powerful enemy, Rupert Genister, nephew to an earl that wants him dead. A battlefield promise made to Sackett's father threatens Genister's inheritance. So, on the eve of his departure for America, Sackett is attacked and thrown into the hold of a pirate ship. Genister's orders? Simple. Make him disappear into the waters of the Atlantic. But, after managing to escape, Sackett makes his way to the Carolina coast. He sees in the raw, abundant land the promise of a bright future. But before that dream can be realized, he must return to England and discover the secret of his father's legacy. Now, this is a fantastic story, and Louis Lamar opens the Sackett series with a bang. The narration is excellent and drives you to an unexpected conclusion. You will not regret the time you spend on this, and you can have this audiobook today. Just head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can have Sackett's Land for free. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also gains you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. The stories we have for this week have a Western feel to them. I think you're going to agree. Our first one comes from Brandon Miller, who lives in Texas, but the story takes place in Arizona. Brandon calls himself an amateur ghost hunter and loves to spend his free time in ghost towns. Arizona is home to nearly 300 ghost towns, some indiscernible from the landscape. While it can be tough to figure out what some of these once lively towns look like or how their daily life operated, there are some towns that are well documented thanks in part to their notorious histories. Enter Brandon and his group, the GTHA, Ghost Town Hunters of America. Hello, Ron. First, let me thank you for reading my story on the air. Your show is amazing and has some of the best stories in the podcasting world. I can't understand why you don't have a million hits every week. Like I told you in my previous note, I investigate ghost towns as a hobby. My group, the GTHA, has traveled the countryside looking for and investigating these places. Probably 95% of the time we find nothing, but we love it. However, 
on June 9, 2018, we hit Ghost Gold. Here is our story. The Vulture Mine was a ghost mine and settlement in Maricopa County, Arizona. The mine began in 1863 and became the most productive gold mine in Arizona history. From 1863 to 1942, the mine produced 340,000 ounces of gold and 260,000 ounces of silver. It attracted more than 5,000 people to the area and is credited with founding the town of Wickenburg, Arizona. The town that served the mine was known as Vulture City. The Vulture Mine began when a prospector from the California Gold Rush, Henry Wickenburg, discovered a quartz deposit containing gold and began mining. After the mine closed in 1942, the city was abandoned and it became a ghost town. Today, the mine and ghost town are privately owned, but tours are offered. Also, it might interest you to know that the mine was a lockdown site on Ghost Adventures, that show on the Travel Channel. Our group signed up for an overnight hunt, which included a two-hour guided walking tour and an overnight stay in one of the remaining buildings of Vulture City. The tour was great, but a bit campy for my tastes. However, that night, we will never forget. Our team was given a roofless building for the night. I think it might have been an old gas station. There was a shell of a 1940 Ford sitting out front, and it just felt like it was waiting to be filled with gas. I'll send you a couple pictures. We set up our camp, built a fire, and got started with hunting the ghosts. John, our photographer, had the first experience. He was getting his equipment together, trying to figure out his strategy for the evening, when he felt a tap on his shoulder. He turned, and there was no one there. Thinking something fell on him, or something like that, he shrugged it off and went back to work. A few seconds later, there was another tap. He turned, and this time he saw an outline of something, but it faded as fast as he saw it, and he wasn't even sure he saw what he saw, but he still informed the group of his experience. I was walking the perimeter of our building. I was calling out to spirits, asking them to join us for the evening around the campfire. I remember I was telling them that we had plenty of beans and franks and that we had enough to feed everyone that wanted to come. The whole time I was holding a recorder. What I captured was quite surprising. I can't be sure because it was so garbled, but I think it said something like, I don't like beans. We did a lot of EVP sessions, tried some triggers, even made some gold digging references and a few other things. By the end of the night, we had a few EVPs and some strange experiences. Feelings that we were being watched, and even one case of being warned to be careful. The biggest event came that night, when we'd all settled down into our sleeping bags until morning. About an hour after we had settled down, I heard a rustling sound coming from the nearby bushes. Thinking it was some sort of animal, I got up to look around. What I saw, I'll never forget. Half a man. He had no legs, but he had arms, a torso, and a head. His face was dark black, with a shroud or a cloud moving around his head. It's very hard to explain. I called out to John to wake up and grab his camera. John came running, but by the time he got there, the creature was gone. Thinking that we had lost our chance to truly get something remarkable on film, John set up to stay there the rest of the night to wait for the entity's return. I decided to walk around some more and investigate to see if I could find any evidence that something or someone had been around. Taking my flashlight, I looked at the ground and I found some really odd footsteps. The problem is that they were leading away from the camp, but I couldn't find any coming towards the camp. I should point out the ground in this area was quite loose, very dust-like, and footprints that were left were very clear and detailed. 
it was easy to see the difference between our tennis shoes from these prints. They looked very much like the boots we saw on our tour that would have been worn in the late 1800s. The rest of the night was uneventful. John never did get his photograph, and the entity never made a return visit. We collected a lot of evidence and personal experiences. All in all, it was one of the best ghost hunts we've ever been on. Brandon Miller, Fort Worth, Texas. Well, Brandon, that is a great story. And I absolutely love the history. Thank you for sharing it. Brandon sent along a couple of pictures, which I will have linked in the show notes. I guess one thing that I would love to do is expand this story. So, Brandon, I invite you to come back to the show whenever you want to share your story again and the evidence you collected. This is an open invitation. We have another western theme story sent in by Roger Matthews of Hollywood. Roger is a singer, songwriter, and actor who wants us to know that he doesn't drink, do drugs, or is crazy. He believes that after you hear his story, you're going to wonder. In his own words, here is Roger's story. I'm a struggling actor and that means you can't be choosy about the jobs you take in order to survive. A friend of mine told me about an acting company that does summer tours performing at campgrounds all through Nevada and Utah. They set up and do weekend shows and then move on to the next. I joined them early in the tour as a replacement for a guy who had broken his leg. His show would not go on, and I would be the new Jimmy in a scary campfire story called The Ghost of Swamp Park. After our last show of the weekend, we had the tradition of inviting all of the campers to a s'mores and taco feast at a bonfire. We would chat with the guests, sing songs, and tell more stories. It's always the hit of the weekend. I would play my guitar and sing, and if I'm honest, this was my favorite part of each week. After each bonfire, one of us would have to stay behind to tend it until it was no longer a threat. Sometimes we had company, but most of the time it was just one person. We would draw lots to see who would get the chore. It was more of a betting game than anything and always was great fun. Until you lost. One of our group members never got the chore the entire season. I ended up with it three times. It was on the third time the perfect storm hit. The bonfire had been held in an open field and was not very close to the campground. It was a dark, clear night. No moon, and I was not only alone, but I felt lonely. I started out my vigil by calming the fire down as much as possible. Then I settled in with my comfy fold-up chair, started my iPod, and I waited. After about thirty minutes, my music went silent. I was sure that I had charged it, but it was dead. The fire was still way too hot to leave, but I decided to start shoveling dirt on it in hopes of speeding things up a bit. It was then I heard a voice say, It's too early for that, you dimwit. Huh? I said with all the intelligence and grace of a baboon. Not to give baboons a bad name, mind you. I looked around and there was no one there. The voice had sounded right next to me, but I was still alone. Out of the darkness, it came again. The fire, you idiot. You can't cover it up. It's too big. Someone slipped me something, I thought. I'm hallucinating badly. You're not hallucinating. Can't you see me? It replied. Uh, no. I'm looking and I'm not seeing a thing. Are you dead? I immediately regretted saying that. Too many ghost stories, I told myself. Way too many and sat down in my cozy chair again. I loved your songs, 
and I'm not sure if I'm dead, he replied. I tried to cover my ears, but I still heard him just fine. He continued, You're a good singer, and you made a lot of them folks very happy. Thank you, I guess. I jumped up. Who is this? Who's out there? I yelled and began running around looking for wires, speakers, people. Heck, I was even looking for a ghost. I didn't find anything. He spoke again. Name's Pete. I'm looking for gold around these parts. I'm not going to be telling you where, so don't ask. I wouldn't think of it, I said flatly. This is crazy, I thought. I've lost it. You're not crazy, and I'm not going to hurt you, lessen you go for my gold. I'd get upset about that. I wouldn't think of it, I said. Where are you? Right here, darn you. As his voice trailed off, I saw the faint outline of a man against the starry backdrop. He was bent over and old. He looked like he had done hard labor his entire life. I said, I'm called Roger, still staring at him. No reply ever came, and the form shifted to mist and floated away. I fell back into my chair and just sat there for some time. To me, it was very real. And the more I go over it, the more I believe I was visited by Pete's ghost. Roger Matthews, Hollywood, California. Wow, Roger, thank you. That is a fantastic story. I have so many questions I would love to ask you. Did you ever research old Pete? Where were you when this happened? And what did it feel like to look at an apparition? I'm guessing that Pete used the battery power in your iPod to talk and show himself to you, then just ran out of time. Roger, I want you to know that you have an open invitation to Ron's Amazing Stories to come here and tell us all about it. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you would like to share, like Roger did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story for this week comes from the OTR Western series that we've not had on the show before. Frontier Town was syndicated by Bruce Ells Productions. The 30-minute program first broadcast in 1949 and ran for 47 episodes. The main character was Chad Remington. His quest to bring his father's killer to justice served as a springboard for a career as a crime-fighting attorney in the small town of Dos Rios. We will hear episode number 9, and it is titled The Opening of the Tioga Reserve. Remington's sidekick, Cherokee, has a plan to rent horses to the participants of a land run. Now, because the series was syndicated, I'm not sure exactly when it first aired. But it had to be in 1949. Please enjoy Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town, El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed, from the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat. These are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for, teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
Not too far below the Continental Divide, and nested in the narrow valley between the Red and the White Rivers, lies the boisterous, brawling frontier town called Dos Rios. That's where I come from. And the little shingle hanging outside my office above the livery stable reads Chad Remington, attorney at law. Now that you know who I am, maybe you're thinking a saddle stop lawyer leads a pretty dull and humdrum life. But don't you ever believe it. No, sir, with the few good folks we have and the few bad ones, out my way, life is pretty raw most of the time. Well, just take what happened to me about a month ago. Cherokee O'Bannon, who owns the livery stable, now that he's reformed from peddling his rattlesnake oil, came hot-footing up the rickety wooden steps which lead to my office, a copy of our weekly newspaper clutched in his hands. Ted, just wait. Just wait here, my boy. You see this. Well, what have you got there, Cherokee? A new formula for a patent medicine that is absolutely guaranteed to cure bad livers, cold shivers, sore withers, and heaves? Nothing of the sort, nothing of the sort. Just read this, right here in this box at the front page. <laughs> okay, here, yeah, let me have it. Oh, federal government throwing Tioga National Forest Reserve open for homesteading. Well, opening up the Tioga Reserve means turning over about 6,000 square miles for settlement. Absolutely correct. And if you know that territory, you'll be as excited as I am. Why, Chad, I believe that Tioga country is even richer than the Dos Rios Valley. Well, now, maybe I'm thinking a little slow this spring weather, but you're going to have to explain to me how it affects you. Chad, you know me well enough by this time to know that I'm not a mercenary man. Why, a dollar doesn't mean any more to me than... Than, than your good right arm. Than my good right? No, certainly not. The only real use I have for money is not for the real me, but for the other me. The drinking me. <laughs> However, when I think of all the folks who are going to make that run into Tioga and settle there, it makes me realize they're going to need horses. And that a livery stable, getting in on the ground floor, should coin money, extended palm over closed digits. That's hand over fist to you. Well, Cherokee, I'm inclined for once to agree with you. A livery stable there stands a fair chance of making some money, but... Now that you're established here, why take the risk of moving to some new place where you might fail? Uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained, they say. Mm. And I'm a venturesome character. How about it, Chad? You haven't taken a trip in months. Why don't we both get down to that land rush and look the Tioga over? Well, if for no other reason, I guess I'd better go just to keep you out of mischief. And anyhow, I must admit I get a real thrill out of seeing something like that. Oh, that's democracy really in action. Chad, you've just warmed the cockles of my heart. <laughs> and now so the other part of me warms up, too. I think I'll repair to the tavern across the street for a, a toast to the future. <laughs> Be sure you make that just one toast. Well, if I'm going to make this trip with you, I'm going over to the judge's house and see Libby. Least I can do is tell her I'm going away. <laughs> Shortly after sunrise, two mornings later, we crested the brow of the hill and looked down on one of the most satisfying sights man's eye has ever been privileged to see. Stretched out in a thin line for more than a mile were horses, mules, wagons, and even a few high-wheeled bicycles. Anything and everything a man or a family could ride in which would take them into the race for a piece of that rich Tioga land. But even Cherokee was in. Chad, and this comes from my heart, this is the most inspiring sight I have ever seen. Oh, it certainly is. History's being made right before our eyes this morning. Can you explain to me exactly how this land rush works? Well, as best I understand it, to make sure that everyone has an equal chance, that no one gets in first and stakes out the choicest land, the government's put up a barrier. Yes, I see the barrier down there now. Well, then you can see all the cavalrymen down there policing the barrier. Only in just about ten minutes, if my watch happens to be right, a bugler's going to come out and blow boots and saddles. Boots and saddles, eh? Yep, to warn everybody to get ready to start. And then a few seconds later, an officer will trigger a rifle. And that shot will be the start of the greatest land rush in history. I never saw this many people all together at once, even when I was making a high pitch from the back of my medicine wagon. 
Men, women, children, dogs. Look at them all. <laughs> Instead of looking at them, let's get down there with them before we miss the starting gun. Up there, fella. Come on. Well, darling, you excited? Oh, Kent, this is a sight I'll never forget as long as I live, never. Well, then you're not sorry we left Atlanta? No, oh, I'll have my moments, but I guess I'm just a farm girl at heart. 320 beautiful acres to work with our own hands, to build into something oh, that'll... Oh, Sue Ellen, are you going to start that all over again? Well, there's plenty of time for ranching when I got the newspaper on a paying basis. Just think, the Tioga Weekly Sun. Kent Ramsey, if you're so much in love with printer's ink, we might just well as stay there. Oh, Sue Ellen, this is no time to start an argument. Hey, look at that, will you? Oh, that big burly looking man in the frock coat trying to push his way to the front of the line ahead of everybody else. Why, look at him, Kent. He's got two bruisers with him. Probably his bodyguards. Well, he better not try to push his way in front of us. Take it easy, take it easy. There's plenty of land to go around. Come on, Fritz, why do let's get through here? Can't he come is on. gonna try to get ahead of us? All right, come on, come on, make a little room through here. Hey, it's all right, brother. Just let us through. Just yes, a minute, friend. Where do you think you're going? Oh, who that? Oh. You there. Oh, that you just said? I said if you think you're going to crowd in ahead of us after we've been waiting up here in line for more than 14 hours, you've got another thing coming. Can't, darling, be careful. He looks meaner than a cornered possum. Oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. Did you say something? Yes, I did. I said you looked meaner than a cornered possum. And it wouldn't surprise me if you were even meaner than that. Why, you, if you don't... It's dark. We're polite to ladies, or at least we try to be. Are you going to get to the back of the line where you belong? Or am I going to have to... Are you going to have to what, my friend? Oh, you mean that? Well, if you're fool enough to want to drag your pop gun, go on. They say experience is the best teacher. Can't, don't. Now leave that gun right where it is. That door on me, Sue Ellen. Can't. All right, all of you, keep your hands up where Who's I can that? see you. Uh -huh. uh -huh. All right, Cherokee, watch my horse. And who do you think you are butting in here? I'm the man who's been following you for the last five minutes, watching you almost run down people to get up to the front of the line. Uh, and I'm the man who's advising you to turn around and go back where you belong, at the rear of the line. You give a lot of cheap orders with that six-gun in your fist. I don't need a six-gun in my fist to see that those orders are carried out. Huh? Here, mister. You hold my gun. Why, uh, sure, sure. Now there's nothing in my fist but fingers. And I'm still telling you to move on. Come on, Fritz. Yeah. You too, Whitey. But Laredo, you... I'm taking your advice this time, mister. But I'm going to give you some advice in exchange. The whole of Tayuga isn't so big that I won't be running into all of you again. Get around there, boy. Come on. got words to thank you enough for what you did. Most of the doing you did, ma'am. When you grabbed your husband's hand and stopped him from drawing his gun, one of those bodyguards of the man they call Laredo had time to get his out just in case his boss was too slow a draw. That's when I thought it was time for me to interfere. Well, if you're rushing into Tioga with the rest of us, you stay Chad, right up better here. better get back on your horse. Here comes the bugler. Oh, here it comes, honey. Get ready. Come on, now, get all ready. Well, look, folks, I've got to get mounted. Riding horses, we'll have a better chance than you folks with your wagon. So Cherokee and I'll go ahead and you follow us. I'd feel better about Mr. Laredo if we were all together for a while. Chad, out distance 
happens almost everybody. Oh, I'm not complaining. I just had a flash of two or three riders cutting up through those trees to our right. Maybe a shortcut. Through those trees? Yeah. And from here, it looks as if one of those men is wearing a frog... Chad! Merciful providence! Whoa there! Whoa! Chad, are you all right? Chad, where did that slug hit you? Great gilded Gilhooli! What am I gonna do now? Here I am in the middle of no place, and Chad Remington's been shot clean off his horse! change, Cherokee had been right. I most certainly had been shot off my horse. A soft-nosed slug from a carbine hit my shoulder and spun me out of the saddle like a pinwheel. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on which end of the rifle you might have been, the wound is a little gory, but not too serious. After washing it and tying it up, we were able to continue. The greeting we'd gotten in the new territory thoroughly convinced Mr. O'Bannon that he didn't want to make his fortune in Tioga. But it was the man in the frock coat who answered to the name of Laredo that made me decide that I was going into Tioga Falls, the little settlement which had sprung up as a metropolis of the new region. So we sort of limped into town. Not finding anyone in the marshal's office, I decided the best place to look for my man was by checking at the office of the newspaper. The Tioga Weekly Sun. Madam, would you be good enough to give us some information? Oh, I certainly are. Well, it's you two again. Camp, my husband and I followed you for several miles, but... Oh, dear, what happened to you? Being in the newspaper office, let's just say it was uh, a little accident. Oh, uh, Camp! Oh, Kent, darling, who do you think's here? Uh, my husband's back in the press room setting up part of this week's edition. Are you calling me, Sue Ellen? I thought I heard you... Hello! Am I glad to see you two again? Well, I don't say this from politeness. We're glad to see you and your wife alive. Huh? After what happened to Chad, we didn't know if they'd gotten you too. If who all had gotten us? That gent we tangled with the other morning at the starting line. The one in the frock coat. Oh, you mean Loretta Jake Ellison? Laredo Jake Ellison, huh? How come you know his name? Oh, why didn't you know? He's opened a bar, a hotel, and a gambling hall, and he's practically running this town already. Did you say a bar? Oh, now, Cherokee, you're incorrigible. Uh, tell me, how'd you happen to open a newspaper office? From the looks of what you had in your wagon, I'd have thought you were going to get yourself a ram. Now, you see, Kent, you even look out of place in a newspaper office. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, it's a long story. But if you're really interested, sit down and I'll tell you. Well, with a little friendly bickering between Sue Ellen and Kent Ramsey, we learned their story. I must say I didn't wholly disagree with Kent. The young fella had real ambition, and a newspaper can be a very influential voice in guiding the destinies of a frontier country. I also learned that Laredo Jake, even in this short time, had almost everyone in and around Tioga Falls either bulldozed or buffaloed, was starting to run the new town very much his own way. It was a wild little town, and I talked to a lot of people and found out nothing, until about the third day when we were chewing the fat with Sue Ellen and Kent in their newspaper office. Well, Chad, what do you think Laredo Jake's going to think of this editorial? I don't think he's going to like it very much, Kent. But if I were you, and I'm not talking just as a lawyer, I'd take it a bit easy. After all, Chad's got more of an axe to grind as far as that crook's concerned. And he's just biding his time. Oh, you all argue with the man. Husband of mine or not, I seem to have no influence on him. <laughs> well, she's afraid she'll be a widow before she's really a bride. It's no laughing matter, Kent. When you're baiting a man like Laredo Jake Ellison, you're not out angling for catfish. You're going for shark. If you don't mind, Cherokee and I will sort of hang around your office tomorrow after the paper comes out and the gentleman in question has had the chance to read what you think of it. Why? 
What Kent Ramsey'd printed in the Tioga Sun would have raised the hackles on a more self-possessed person than Mr. Ellison. Well, we waited most of the day, and then late in the afternoon we saw him coming. Cherokee and I shifted our holsters just in case and waited for Laredo to say so. Boys, I'll tell you why I dropped in. I come by to congratulate the Ramseys on getting out a fine fight in the newspaper. <laughs> I believe that about as much as I believe that my rattlesnake oil cures lead poisoning. You're wrong, my friend. Because in this last week, I've had my eyes open. You're lucky someone didn't close them. Yes, sir, I've had my eyes open. I never knew before what an enormous influence a newspaper can have in a town. Mr. Ellison, we'd appreciate it if you'd stop beating around the bush. All right, Mrs. Ramsey. Since finding out how important a newspaper is, I've decided to make you an offer to buy you out. An offer I don't think you'll refuse. And suppose I do refuse, what then? What then? I don't know. I can't make you sell out. But I don't think you're going to turn down an offer of $10,000. Ellis and I wouldn't sell out to you for $30,000. You know, I've always heard that literary men didn't have good business heads, but I never believed it before. Well, there's no use wasting any more time. I'll just be bidding you a very pleasant good day. Well, how do you like that? Here I was, sitting with my both fists cocked, all ready to go, and he talked so sweet butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. I'll bet you he's got something up his sleeve. So will I. Why, he's so persnickety mean, I wouldn't even throw him in a swamp to alligators. My word. At this rate, Chad, we could spend six months down here trying to find something on that galoot. Trying to find something on him? Well, I guess we might as well confess it. That little accident which put a bandage on my shoulder when I rode into town, I'm afraid was no accident at all. But it had been planned by Tioga's leading citizen, the right dishonorable Jake Ellison. Chad hadn't been turned halfway around his saddle, he wouldn't be here to tell the story. Why, that vicious sneaking no good. Imagine, Kent. You know what I got a good mind to do, Chad? I got a mind to run that story of yours about Loretta right smack on the front page of my next edition. Uh-uh, nothing doing, Kent. Even as poor a lawyer as I am, I know we haven't got a case built against him yet. Case? Why, you all just said he tried to kill you. We all just told you a little story, a story no one can prove. Well, then how are you going to prove anything against a contemptible crook like that? By exercising a little patience. Now, for example, he wouldn't be so sure of himself that he'd come in here and offer to buy your paper if he didn't feel he had this town and this whole country right where he wanted it. So? So I'm expecting that life around Tioga isn't going to be as peaceful even as it has been. Now, there are too many gunslingers hanging around his cafe to be just waiting for Sunday to go to church, if we had a church. I'll make book on that and give you six, two, and even. Not bad odds, either. Suppose you're right, Chad. Well, then, I think we can take a leaf out of Laredo's book and play it smart ourselves. <laughs> when you've got a newspaper, mister, plus a little patience, it shouldn't be too hard to prove that the pen is mightier than the sword. Now, I don't want to sound like an I told you so, but it wasn't very long before the Wells Fargo safe was blown. And 24 hours later, the stagecoach coming in from the north was held up. And then the very same night, two men who'd won at Pharaoh never got home. Well, the next afternoon, Cherokee got himself a little Dutch courage at one saloon and then walked over to the place that Laredo Jake ran. Well, Laredo, here's to you. <laughs> here's to all of us, Fitz. Drink hearty. Yeah, yeah. I cut up the Wells Fargo money today. Twelve hundred apiece. You stick with Laredo Jake Ellison Fitz, and you'll be wearing... <laughs> no, I wonder what this monkey wants. You looking for me, my friend? No, sir. I was looking for a fellow called Fred. Yeah. Mr. Ramsey down at the newspaper office asked me to find him. Oh. Well, Fritz ain't here just now, but I'm expecting him soon. Tell Ramsey I'll give him his message and send him down. Thanks. Thanks very much. Sure to do it. What the blazes do you think they wanted me at the newspaper office? What do you think? 
Probably figuring to pull a double cross on me. On you. Why, he's loco. You go down there, Fritz. See what he wants. Yeah? And if he gets too hard to handle, well, you know what to do. Oh, sure, Larry. Don't worry. You heard me. Now get going. I can't wait to find out what this is all about. <laughs> Say, Ellison, uh, you got a minute? No. Huh? Oh, you still hanging around Tioga Falls? You should have found out by this time that a loyal starved to death in this town. Oh, I don't know. Looks now as if you might be needing one. What would I want with a dead lawyer? Dead lawyer? After the way you missed me that first day into Tioga? Or maybe you're a bum shot, but I think our local editor has hit the bullseye plum center. Huh? Here. Yeah, I thought you'd like to get a look at tomorrow morning's paper. Why, that good-for-nothing lying... Looks pretty bad in print, doesn't it? Confederate's confession implicates cafe owner in robberies. <laughs> yeah, looks like you're all done, doesn't it, Laredo? Why do you think Ramsey sent for your friend, Fritz? What are you trying to do? Scare me? Well, if you're not scared, why don't you walk down to the newspaper office and face Fritz? Deny these things right in front of him. Why, sure. Sure, I'll go with... You double-dealing liar. Hey, Fritz! Yeah. Fritz, come over here. Yeah. And you, Mr. Lawyer, you stay right where you are. Hey, that big galoot who came in here and said they wanted me at the newspaper office must have been crazy. I waited more than an hour, and that editor wasn't even... Did you tell Ramsey I engineered those raids? You out of your head. Why should I give you away? Oh, uh -huh. yes, Fritz. Why should you? If I were you, Ramsey, then I'd shut up. But fortunately, you're not me, and I'm not you. Because that gun toter of yours said just enough in front of a few dozen people to put you in the calaboose. Hey, Marshal. Marshal, are oh, you sneaking low down? Drop that gun, Ellison. Miss me again, Loretto. But I'll see if I can make my aim a little better. Now, Fritz... You don't want to end up worse off than your boss, just take it easy. Because you and I are going down to the newspaper office and get a real confession. You should have seen Chad. His arms like two windmills. His fists like two pile drivers. Why, I tell you, the man was magnificent. A perfect example of American manhood. Oh, good night. With that kind of flowery prose, Kent, well, you ought to keep Cherokee here in Tioga and put him to work on your newspaper. <laughs> of course, not as a reporter. He got his facts a little wrong. Oh, but he makes it sound so beautiful. Well, what facts has he got wrong? Oh, just a few essential ones. For example, uh, I had only one fist flying. My other hand was well occupied wrestling that buzzard for his gun. Now, just one fist. You can't blame that entirely on me. That saloon you sent me to for my Dutch courage... Treated me so well, I was seeing double. <laughs> <laughs> and moreover, Mr. Remington, I was not wrong when I say that your brilliance, your sheer and unmatched genius, gave birth to the idea which caught that crook. Cherokee's right about that, Chad. It was you who had the idea to print up a single copy of the paper with that phony headline to trick Ellison. Maybe it was phony, but now you can run 3,000 copies of the paper with the same headline because it's true. And Cherokee, how about you and me starting back to Dos Rios? Right now, Chan? Right now. With all the ill fortune. While you were demolishing Ellison's saloon, I saved one full bottle from falling off a table and hit it under a chair. Can I go back down there for just a minute? Nothing doing. I told you we'd stay just long enough to get our proof, and Cherokee, I certainly didn't mean hundred proof. <laughs> <laughs> Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. This is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood.
So what did you think of that one? The story premise was real. Land rushes were a big part of how the West was settled. A land run or land rush was an event in which previously restricted land in the United States was open to homesteading on a first arrival basis. The settlers, no matter how they acquired occupancy, then purchased the land from the United States Land Office. For former Indian lands, the Land Office distributed the sales funds to the various tribes based upon previously negotiated terms. The Kickapoo land run of 1895 was the last in Oklahoma. There was one land run in the 20th century, but on a much smaller scale. It was held to select lots in the community of Arcadia, California on August 6, 1901. The role of Tex Remington was initially played by Jeff Chandler. Yes, the movie actor, and yes, you heard him in today's story. Halfway through the program's run, the role was assumed by Reed Hadley. Remington's sidekick, Cherokee O'Banion, was played by Wade Crosby, who decided to use the speech patterns of W.C. Fields. Do you think he was successful? I, for one, found the character rather enjoyable. I'm hoping that you like the series, and I hope to be playing a few more Frontier Town Adventures. Mother, it does your heart good, I know, when your young folks eat all of their breakfast cereal. That's why I'm so happy to tell you about new Sugar Crinkles. Sugar Crinkles, you know, is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Crisp golden nuggets of sugar-coated rice. They make breakfast more fun than a circus. Why, young folks love Sugar Crinkles so much, they disappear like magic. Now, you've had experience with sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet to you and others that just don't seem sweet enough to the youngsters. Well, what a wonderful surprise Sugar Crinkles will be to your whole family. For new Sugar Crinkles really are just right sweet. Remember, Sugar Crinkles make great snacks, too. Better get several packages. For your breakfast or a snack, you love Sugar Crinkles. Sugar Crinkles can't be beat. Sugar ice cream that's just right sweet. With milk for a breakfast joy. As a snack from the pack, oh boy. Can't be beat, just right sweet. Sugar crinkles, good to eat. Now back to... That was episode number 536, and we're getting up there. Today, I want to thank Brandon Miller and Roger Matthews for their stories. Of course, they were amazing. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.